Have Canadian unions strayed far beyond their original mission of improving pay, benefits and working conditions? I suspect they have. In September 2023, just days before the One Million March for Children, union leaders convened in an emergency secret Zoom call to organize and counter protest against parental inclusion in schools. Ordinary parents and citizens found their voices for the very first time that day, many of whom who'd never organized or participated in a protest before in their lives. They were simply speaking out against what they viewed as far-left politicization of schools with cultural socialist propaganda. I'm Melanie Bennett, and welcome to another episode of What the Heck Are Unions Getting Up To? So why are union executives so worried about ordinary citizens exercising their democratic rights to peaceful assembly? Don't take my word for it. Let's listen to Yolanda Bedesi, Toronto District School Board teacher and executive member of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Good morning, bonjour tout le monde. As Rob said, my name is Yolanda Bedesi. My pronouns are she, her, and elle. And as you heard, I'm the director of human rights here at the OFL. Uh, as Vicky and Shawnee and Rob and Patty have said, it is more important now than ever to organize around these issues um, in getting a rapid response team in your area. What we are saying is that in many people have in this effort attempted to contact members of the 2SLGBTQIA plus community. And one thing that we have noted is that this is not a fight for that community. This is definitely a fight for allies. And when we say allyship, this is not a situation where we're all going to be retweeting. This is a situation where, as my colleague Felicia says, we need to be, as allies, we need to be co-conspirators. We need to be in the effort in such a way that when the rocks are hitting these communities, that they're hitting us. And if as allies, we are in such a distance that we are standing by and watching them, we are not really there. And we need to be in a situation where when something like this happens, we as communities, as allies, as supporters, are able to organize and mobilize quickly in a way that we know at any time when anything is called that we have these systems, not just for the 2SLGBTQIA plus community, for any Islamic or anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim sentiments, for anti-Black, anti-Semitism, anti-women. We need to be there. We need to have these in our communities, in our workplaces, in our locals, so that we are able to move quickly. And um, as labor, this is what we do. We organize. We know where our members are. We know who's able to come out there. But this is a situation where we have an opportunity to talk to our members, have those one-on-one conversations, know who is where and well-placed, know what's happening in our communities that isn't labor, know what other organizations are already doing this, know um, that having members in the community there to, to speak about what their needs are. Uh, We have created a PowerPoint, and I'm not sure who's going to be sharing this, to go through some steps, because as people have said, we need to be able to do this. We need to do this counter-protest and our own protest in a way that is um, systematic, systematic, that is organized, that is ready to go in a moment's notice, and that is safe. So if somebody can share the PowerPoint, please, it's definitely not going to be me. And we will walk through some of the steps. Our main questions are, though, do you know what is happening in your area? Do you know that this is happening? Do you have that information? Are you able to join a counter-protest that's already happening? Or are you able to, and and for some of us, this is what's going to have to happen, to organize, to anchor an event, to get people out there, to mobilize, to amplify the message so that we have as many people there as possible. Those of you who, unlike, unfortunately, have gone to the website have seen how much hatred there is, but it's not as organized as they might think. We can see that it's a very much a cut and paste email type of organization. We need to be able to respond to that in a much better way. So thank you. That's the first slide. We're saying enough is enough to hate. So second slide, please. Um, as you've heard, this is a mass nationwide coordinated protest. We see who they're targeting and what they're doing, which is the, the insidious way is that they're saying that they are protecting children. And we know that far from protecting children, this is actually an attack on children and on communities. Next slide, please. So as we are saying, um, as allies, we need to come together and say enough is enough. We are not going to tolerate the hate, the intolerance, or the indoctrination, any form in any camp. We're going to organize, and we're going to have rapid response teams ready to combat this hate. And we all need to be co-conspirators in the community to stand up for this group, especially this time on the 20th, but all oppressed groups. Next, please. Um, 
we need to make sure that in, in these attempts that we're confronting the hate groups, we're organizing and mobilizing, that we're responding quickly. What is, um, as someone said, we're used to the type of hate and rhetoric that we see coming from the United States. What 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 is unique about this is that it's it's now being under the guise of being led by parents. It's being led by the guise of being led by religious faith um, and some sort of ethnic communities. And we need to be very sure that we make sure that our response is based on the hate and not on the people. And it's a very easy way to di to divide many diverse communities by put by pitting us against each other. But within labor, within progressive movements, we need to know we know about intersectionality and we know that hate can come in many forms, but it's a lot of ignorance. And so we need to make sure that our message is targeted towards the message as opposed to the people who are saying it, because in that way, we're, we're not going to fall prey to their usual ways of bigotry. Next slide, please. So what we're asking you to do is to make sure that you're able to plan this protest. It's very easy steps. We're sharing the information with our network. We're confirming attendance. One thing that we do really well in, in labor is that we, we, we mobilize really well, but we don't organize. So we need to make sure that we know who is coming, who will be there, who is leading it. Before the event, make signs and posters, whether you do it together, come together and do it, or have people do it with slogans that, again, are targeted at the message of anti-hate and not at the groups of people who are promoting it, that we communicate these details with our groups. Very importantly is that we arrive 30 minutes before at least this, their, their planned protest so that we are occupying the space, that it becomes our message, and that we are then establishing ourselves. So that we are not going into their protest, that we are already there and we have established ourselves. Make sure that you have a megaphone, mic, music, flags, posters, banners, chant sheets. We know, we know how to do that. And that Use that opportunity to speak with people, to spread the real message, have a petition ready there, have clipboards, have pens so that you can speak with people, get their information so that your rapid response team is going to be a team that you can call on any time and it's going to be growing. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be me who's speaking about this. I might pass it off also to Shawnee, but we have resources that um, the OFL has prepared for in general about protests, but specifically for this one, just some very basic things. And we're going to put some links in the chat to some for some resources to so make sure that when you're there, you're staying safe and staying positive. We don't want this to to devolve um, into something that is messy. We know that there's going to be media there and we need the message to be about a group of progressive workers who have come out in support of this community as opposed to a brawl that ensues with a negative issue. So stay with a buddy, don't engage in the conflict, keep a safe distance, focus on your positive message. We're gonna respect all the laws. We're gonna try to deescalate wherever possible. And as I said, it, what's very important is to take up the space. Take it up physically with the amount of people you have, take it up with the noise you're using, take it up with the flags and the signs that you have with these messages of love and positivity. Next slide, please. Here we have, and we're going to put these links to the sites in the chat, but we have five really great resources here uh, in terms of how you can plan a safe and effective protest or counter protest. And last slide, please. I believe that is the last slide. Uh, the next steps that you're going to do after this, uh, plan a debrief meeting with your group. Very important for so many reasons, and especially at one that is as going to be as uh, charged as this one. Give people a chance you know, who may have been triggered, who may have been um, physically hurt, emotionally hurt, to talk about what happened. What did we see? What did we learn? What can we do better next time? Make sure that you can maintain this communication with your contact list. Continue to talk to and recruit members to be part of your rapid response team. And I call it a rapid response team because for many communities, the idea of a flying squad is in itself a triggering term. So rapid response, because that's what we want to do, respond rapidly and get in there and help people. So be vigilant for other hate events that, can, that you can disrupt with your groups. And make sure that we are also joining other counter protests that are planned by other organizations so that we are doing the support and, and we're all getting together and being, being disrupting and, and causing some good trouble. Now, these parents are not extremists. They're not anti-anything. They're simply advocating for parental inclusion in schools, age-appropriate materials and resources, and political neutrality in the classroom. That's pretty reasonable, right? 
Well, not according to Yolanda. Why would Yolanda be talking about organizing rapid response teams and counter protests against what she claims to be an attack? Okay, let's get real here. These parents are asking schools to not keep secrets from them about gender and about what their children are being taught in the classroom by activist teachers. They're asking for age-appropriate content in the classroom that's hardly the stuff of pitchforks and torches. So what exactly is Yolanda suggesting here? Well, she wants to mobilize against parents. In her own words, she says, we need to be in a situation where when something like this happens, we as communities, as allies, as supporters, are able to organize and mobilize quickly. Mobilize quickly. That sounds well and good, but let's dig a little deeper. Why are teachers like Yolanda, organizing counter-protests against parents who are advocating for involvement in their children's education to be told the truth. Does that seem like an overreach? I mean, last time I checked, schools were supposed to be places of learning, not battlegrounds for political activism. Yolanda also said in this clip that allies need to be co-conspirators, not just retweeting from a distance, but getting involved in a way that they take hits too. She put it like this, as my colleague Felicia says, we need to be, as allies, co-conspirators in such a way that when the rocks are hitting these communities, they're hitting us. Co-conspirators, rocks hitting communities. What on earth is she talking about? These parents are not throwing rocks, literal or metaphorical, at anyone. They're showing up to say, hey, we'd like a voice in our children's education, please. But Yolanda's talking like we're gearing up for some kind of battlefield. Let's not forget here that Yolanda Badesi is a teacher. I believe she's a secondary school teacher in the Toronto District School Board. She's supposed to foster a safe and respectful environment, but instead she's out here organizing against the very parents in her, uh, of, the, of the students in her classrooms. Does that sound like the kind of behavior that we should be expecting from teachers? I don't think it is. As a member of the Ontario College of Teachers, Yolanda's held to high standards of integrity, respect, and care. By framing parents as enemies and pushing this idea of a rapid response counter-protest, she's arguably violating those standards. Instead of promoting dialogue and understanding, she's contributing to a hostile, divisive atmosphere. I don't remember Yolanda reaching out to anyone that I know, or anyone else at the TDSB for that matter. So here's the big question. Do we really want teachers who see parents as opponents in the classroom. It's time for educators like Yolanda to get back to what they're meant to be doing, and that is teaching, and leave the political activism at the door. Parents being involved in their children's education, even parents that you may disagree with on a political level, is not a crime. We need to hold these ideologues to account. If you liked this coverage of the Zoom call, I have plenty of other videos of the speakers of this call. And if you feel so inclined, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.